uh, when we were covering multimodal learning, we covered Dolly and everything in Dolly was straightforward. And the idea was if you have an image, can you turn it into a sequence of integers? And if you were able to do that, then you, could be, you would be able to treat images as if they are text, and then you can borrow ideas from text, like next word prediction or next token prediction. And then you could start generating images by the task of next token prediction in a zero shot fashion. So you're just gonna keep looking at the internet. And your task is whenever you're processing an image, uh, you're gonna process the tokenized image. And whenever you're processing text, you're gonna process the tokenized version of your text and you're gonna do next token prediction. The only thing that wasn't a straightforward was how do you actually do the tokenization? How do you take an image and turn it into a sequence of tokens or a sequence of integers? And the technology behind it was discrete variation autoencoders. And in particular, you are using Gumball softmax. Let's cover Gumball softmax today. But let's start a little bit more generic and then we are gonna narrow down to the problem that we want to solve. Let's say you have a neural network and initially you're gonna start with some parameters. These are the parameters of your neural network. X is now your neural network, which is gonna depend on the parameters that you chose. And then if you know X, you're gonna perhaps compute your loss function. Mm -hmm. And the flow of information is, I know my theta, I'm gonna know my X, and I'm gonna know my F of X. And everything is deterministic. These are the type of architectures that we have been writing so far before going into generative models. And then differentiating that was easy. You would just do back propagation. Take the derivative of f with respect to x, multiply it by the derivative of x with respect to theta, and then you uh, have your gradients. With the stochastic architectures, you have theta that is defining a probability distribution over a random variable then you are gonna keep sampling from that random variable to write down your last function. So again, you have some parameters, they are defining your probability distribution. You keep sampling from that probability distribution, push them through the rest of your architecture and that's gonna give you perhaps your last function at the end or any other objective function or any other output in general. The first part is easy. You can take derivative with respect to Z and you're gonna be fine. This other portion is also fine. We can take derivative of your probability distribution with respect to theta, with respect to parameters, but then uh, there is a discontinuity here. How are you gonna differentiate through sampling process? And this is the difference between a stochastic neural network and a deterministic neural network. And these are stochastic nodes. When Z was continuous, here we would do the reparameterization trick, if your P of Z or if your parameters are defining the mean and the standard deviation of a normal distribution on a random variable Z, then you would just do your reparameterization trick, sample from usual Gaussian distribution with mean zero and standard deviation being identity, and then add the mean and the standard deviation back. So it's going to be mu plus sigma of your sample. And then this was the way that you were taking your derivatives and going backward. And Gumball softmax is going to enable us to do discrete stuff here. But there is an alternative way, and this is what we are going to see in reinforcement learning. You're going to have the same pattern when you do reinforcement learning. You have a policy function, which is given some parameters. You're going to write down a probabilistic policy, and then your actions are gonna be samples from that policy. And you take an action and then you're gonna get a reward for it. So there is a relationship between reinforcement learning and the stochastic neural networks and generative models. And what is the process when it comes to reinforce? Or equivalently, it's a different name for it, likelihood ratio estimator. This trick, we saw it when we were doing hard attention. The derivative of your log of a probability is gonna be the derivative of the probability divided by the probability itself. Or if you rearrange the furniture, the derivative of your probability is your probability times the derivative of the log of your probability. 
this we are going to keep seeing again. So it's a good idea to learn it once and for all, because it's a trick that we're going to keep using over and over again. Why is this useful? You have your f of z, which is exactly this quantity here. You keep sampling from your probability distribution, and then that's going to give you your objective function then that you want to minimize or maximize. In any way, you're going to need its derivative. f doesn't depend on parameters theta, or maybe f has its own parameters, and then it's going to be easy to take their, its derivatives with respect to those parameters or the parameters of f. What is parameterized here is the probability distribution on z, from which you are going to keep sampling samples, or you are going to keep sampling examples. You want to know this derivative, and you want to take a derivative and push it inside this integral operation. If your probability didn't depend on theta, then you would just do that. But this is not mathematically justified if the probability distribution on z is actually dependent on the thing that you want to take the derivative with respect to. What are you going to do? You're going to use this trick. You can uh, turn this expectation into an integral. So that's going to be integral of f of z times the probability of z. Now you can take a derivative, push it inside the integral. f doesn't depend on those parameters. And then the derivative is going to end up on the probability. So you're going to have this term. What you're going to have is going to be the integral of f of z times the gradient of t with respect to theta. But then you're going to use this formula here that's going to give you the integral of f of z times p of theta times the gradient of the log. f of z times the gradient of the log, let's keep it, that integral with respect to p is now going to give you your expectation back. So this trick is going to help you take the gradient and push it inside expected expectation operation. And then some logs are going to appear seemingly out of nowhere, but there is math behind it. Okay, was this clear so far? Okay, perfect. And why is this useful? Because it is not going to require backpropagating through f or the sample z. So you're just going to bypass your stochastic, the stochastic part of your neural network. Let me unravel this figure first. So what you just did is you're bypassing, differentiating the stochastic layer and this f layer, and you're going a different route. Okay, perfect. But there is a catch. Nothing is for free. This is mathematically justified. It's going to give you an unbiased estimate for the derivative of the expectation, but it's going to suffer from high variance throughout the learning. And the example that I was giving you last session about a student submitting an assignment to the teacher, the teacher grading it, giving the grade back, which is going to f of z, and then not telling the student how they compare to the rest of the class. And the student is going to keep adjusting their behavior at random sometimes, and that is what is causing the high variance. But then if you give them a baseline, in this case, it's going to be a control variate of how good it is, the actions that they took, then they're going to be able to adjust their behavior in a less random fashion. But mathematically speaking, you're going to have a control variate which could depend on z, or which could be independent of z. Usually, it's, it's going to be assumed that it's independent of z. But even if it depends on z, you can take the expected value of b of z, the log, the gradient of the log, let's call it something, and then you're going to have an estimate for the gradient of the expected value of your objective function. And then this is just going to come out of writing the definition of mu b and then taking it back inside here. So you're just adding and subtracting mu b. And if you add and subtract it and rearrange the furniture, this is your reward minus the baseline. And then you can er play around with your baseline so that you're reducing the variance. And then you can answer the question of what is a good baseline, okay? But usually, if you assume b is not a function of z, something nice happens. You can take b outside, so we don't need to worry about it for a while, it's going to be expected value of z of the gradient of the log of your probability. Let's turn this into an integral. It's going to be integral of p of z times the gradient of log of p of z. 
let's use this formula again. That's going to give you the gradient of P of Z. So now you have an integral of the gradient of P of Z. Take the gradient out. Integral of probability is one by definition. Integral of any probability is just one. The gradient of any constant is just zero. And then you are multiplying that by your B, which is going to end up being zero. I mean, in the end, your new B is going to end up being zero. And that's why people usually choose B not to be a function of Z, because then you don't need to worry about mu B anymore. You just set it to be zero. But even if you don't do that, you're just going to be fine anyways. Okay, was that clear? I need to hear a couple of yeses. Okay, perfect. And there is a large class of problems or large class of methods following this process, like Envil, Darn, Moprop, Beamco. You can take a look at the paper and then go ahead and read the citation if you're interested in. But a large class of methods are gonna to belong to this category. And when we do reinforcement learning, we're gonna need this again. And this is exactly the reinforced algorithm, okay? So when we go to reinforcement learning, if I don't have slides on reinforce, it's because we covered it. And this is exactly what you're doing. Your forward pass, you're fine. Given a parameter, you write down your probability distribution, you sample from it, push it through the rest of your neural network, get your reward, get your uh, loss function. And then once you're going backward, you have F, you have the gradient of the log of P of theta, and this is exactly what you have here. And then if you differentiate this with respect to F, that's gonna give you your log back. If you take the derivative of your log with respect to P, it's gonna give you one over P. If you take the derivative of P with respect to theta, that's gonna give you everything that you need. In the end, your derivative is going to be f hat times one over p times whatever gradient that you get here. And that's back propagation. And you bypassed this route. So whenever your reward or your objective function is not differentiable, you usually bypass it this way if you go the reinforcement learning route. There is an alternative, and this is just a straight through estimator. And it's going to say that if you have a random variable here, regardless of its, its shape, whether it is discrete, whether it is continuous, its derivative, let's just assume is a one. And this is going to end up giving you an estimate for your derivatives. And there are actually some papers that do that, usually the older ones. 